Carl, I've read your book on how animals think and feel. Non-human animals, some of them have pretty complex emotional lives, don't they? Some of them certainly do, and there are analogies that I think are really interesting, um, you know, among especially some of the social animals. Um, elephants, for instance, they live in female-led family groups. When the males get to be adolescents, they leave. They have a different kind of social life history. Females always stay together. You're always with your mother. You're always with your sisters and all of those children. And what keeps them cohered is really deep emotional bonds. It, it, and they display it in many ways. They display it in the way that they greet and touch. They display it in the anxiety that they show. If they're separated, they have separation anxiety that you can see. Um, one, one of the researchers I was working with was telling me that sometimes on a really, really windy day, when elephants can't hear each other, one of them may be separated from everybody and they, and they suddenly realize, hey, I'm alone. And they start trumpeting and they're, they're all alarmed and they really want to get back to the group. Um, wolves, have, wolves live in nuclear families. This thing we call a pack is usually mom and dad and their offspring up to the age of adolescence. And then those offspring leave to try to find their own stake in the world, very similar to the way we live, which is why we have wolves lying around our floor and on our sofa and not <laughs> chimpanzees. Chimpanzees do not live that way. They are constantly contesting for dominance. Wolves live in nuclear families. The bonds are really, really tight in those families, but their relationship with other families who hold adjacent territories varies. With some, it's kind of like, you stay there, I'll stay there. And with others, it's quite murderous. And some of them have a tendency to want to expand into your territory. Their territory is not as good quality, there's not as much food there. So that has sparked a lot of conflict in humans, especially, uh, especially some tribal groups uh, in the past, not modern wars so much, uh, which tend to be more ideological. Um, sperm whales, uh, extremely interesting. Well, let me, let me say killer whales first. There are killer whales whose... They, they live in pods, which are family groups. Pods that will socialize are called communities. And then certain communities will not socialize with the adjacent community. They will avoid each other for reasons that have nothing to do with ecology or anything else obvious. It just seems like the cultural differences keep them apart. Sperm whales are the, uh, well, they live in female-led groups like elephants. The families that will socialize are called clans. But the remarkable thing about them is that they have a way of vocally communicating what clan they belong to, and this can be communicated to other sperm whale groups that they have never met before. And sperm whales and human beings are the only known animals who can tell if another individual is a member of a group they belong to, even if they've never met them before, because of some, some representational signal. In our case, it could be language, it could be an insignia, it could be a style of dress. In their case, it's these click patterns called codas that they vocalize that tells everybody which clan they belong to.